In this video, we're going to talk about free radical reactions. But first, let's focus on radicals. What are radicals and how are radicals formed? A radical is basically any species or any atom with an unpaired number of electrons. So any atom that has an odd number of electrons will have at least one unpaired electron. And so that's going to be a radical. Now let's talk about how they're formed. You need to be familiar with two types of bond cleavages. A homolytic bond cleavage and a heterolytic bond cleavage. Let's talk about a heterolytic bond cleavage. The prefix hetero means different, whereas the suffix lytic or lysis means to split apart. In a heterolytic bond cleavage, Typically, you have two different atoms attached by means of a bond. And when that bond breaks, the electrons go towards the more electronegative atom. And so it's going to separate into charges. One of the atoms will acquire a positive charge, and the other one will acquire a negative charge. So let's consider two examples. So let's consider the carbon bromine bond. And carbon likes to form four bonds, so let's draw that around it. So when the carbon-bromine bond breaks, what's going to happen? Which element will acquire the two electrons in this bond? In order to answer that question, we need to consider electronegativity. The, the electronegativity of bromine is about 2.8. For carbon, it's 2.5. So bromine is more electronegative than carbon. Therefore, when that bond breaks, bromine is going to pull the electrons toward itself. Bromine has a partial negative charge. Carbon has a partial positive charge when they're bonded together. When that bond breaks, we're going to get a carbocation. And we're also going to get a bromide ion. So this is an example of a heterolytic bond cleavage. Now let's consider another example. So this time we're going to attach carbon to hydrogen. Now when a carbon hydrogen bond breaks, which element will receive the two electrons? Hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1. For carbon, it's 2.5. So relative to hydrogen, carbon is partially negative, hydrogen is partially positive. So because carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, when this bond breaks, the electrons will go to carbon. And so we're going to get a carb anion instead of a carbocation. And hydrogen will have a positive charge. So a heterolytic bond cleavage, when that occurs, you get two different ions. You get an ion with a positive charge and an ion with a negative charge. Because the electrons, they will be distributed unequally when that bond breaks. Well, in a homolytic bond cleavage, when the bond breaks, the electrons will be distributed equally. In a homolytic bond cleavage, you have two atoms of the same kind bonded to each other. So a good example of this would be two bromine atoms. If you were to add heat to bromine, or if you were to irradiate it with ultraviolet light, the bond between the two bromine atoms will break. Now, because each bromine atom are identical, they will pull on the electrons in that bond equally. So half of the electrons will go to the bromine on the left and the other half will go to the bromine on the right. Now keep in mind, a full arrow represents the flow of two electrons. A half arrow represents the flow of one electron. And so what we're going to get is two radicals or two bromine atoms. So as we can see, each bromine atom 
has an unpaired electron. So therefore, they're radicals. Radicals are very reactive. Bromine wants to have eight electrons. So it's going to react with something to strip off an electron so it can have eight. So radicals tend to be very, very reactive species. Now, when dealing with free radical reactions, you need to be able to identify three important steps, initiation, propagation, and termination. So I'm going to show you how you can do that. The first step is initiation. And here's how you can tell. Whenever you have a neutral molecule turning into two radicals, that step is called initiation. So anytime you have two radicals on the right side of the equation, it's initiation. During propagation, you have one radical on the left and one radical on the right. And the last step, termination, this occurs anytime you have two radicals on the left. So remember, if you have two radicals on the right, it's initiation. If you have two radicals on the left, it's a termination step. And if you have a radical on the left and a radical on the right, it's a propagation step. For the sake of practice, go ahead and pause the video and then identify each reaction as either an initiation step, propagation, or termination step. So let's look at the first one. Is this initiation, propagation, or termination? Well, we have a radical on the left and a radical on the right. Since we have a radical on both sides of the equation, this is going to be a propagation step. Let me use a different color to identify it. Now, what about number two? Is it initiation, propagation, or termination? Notice that we have two radicals on the left, and we don't have any on the right. So we're terminating the radicals. This is going to be a termination step. For number three, we don't have any radicals on the left, but we're creating two radicals on the right. So anytime you have two radicals on the right, it's initiation. For number four, we have two radicals on the left, the same as number two. So that is a termination step. For number five, we also have two radicals on the left. So that's termination. Number six, we have a radical on the left and one on the right. That's a propagation step. And number seven, the same is true. We have a radical on the left side and on the right side of the chemical equation. So that's another propagation step. So now that we've considered how to identify the steps of a radical reaction as being either initiation, propagation, or termination, let's talk about the chlorination of methane. So methane is an alkane, and we're going to react it with chlorine gas. Now, we can either add heat to it, or we can irradiate the mixture with ultraviolet light. Doing any one of these things will create radicals, and so this is going to be a free radical reaction. A free radical reaction is a substitution reaction. We're going to substitute one of the hydrogen atoms with chlorine. So we're going to get CH3Cl as one of the products, so this is methyl chloride, and the other product will be hydrochloric acid. So that's a free radical substitution reaction. But now let's talk about the mechanism for this process. So the first thing that happens is that we generate two radicals. So this is going to be initiation. So we can either, we can add heat or we can add ultraviolet light. And what's going to happen is this bond is going to break. So we're going to get a homolytic cleavage we're going to get two chlorine radicals. Now, if you want to, you can show all of the lone pairs on the chlorine atom. So chlorine actually has seven valence electrons. But just to keep it, uh, just to keep things simple, going forward, sometimes I'm just going to write uh, one dot like this to indicate it's a chlorine radical. So that's the first step, it's initiation. We need to generate the radicals.
Now, once we have our chlorine radical, chlorine can then react with methane, which I'm going to write it like this. So one electron from chlorine will be used to form a bond between H and Cl. And one electron between carbon and hydrogen will also be used to create that bond. So we're going to get hydrochloric acid. And the other electron will go back to carbon. So we're going to get a methyl radical. Now what type of step is this? Would you say it's initiation? propagation or termination. So notice that we have a radical on the left and one on the right. So this step is a propagation step. And so far we have one of the two products in the reaction. We need to get the other product. So here's what we can do to get it. We're going to start with the methyl radical. Actually, Let's write chlorine first. So we're going to start with Cl2, and then we're going to react it with this methyl radical that we just formed. So one of the electrons in the chlorine-chlorine bond will be used with the electron on the methyl radical to create a bond between the methyl group and the chlorine atom, which I'm going to write it like this. So that's the same as methyl chloride. And then the other electron will go to this chlorine atom, regenerating the chlorine radical. So the process can be repeated. So this step is also a propagation step because we have a radical on the left and a radical on the right. So during a propagation step, the presence of radicals continue. During an initiation step, you're creating radicals. During the termination step, you're eliminating radicals. But during a propagation step, the reaction is occurring without any increase or decrease in the total number of radicals. So we started with a radical and we ended with a radical. So just by using these three steps, we have our two products. We have hydrochloric acid and we also have methyl chloride. Now there are some other things that can occur while this reaction is happening. Now let's talk about it. So while the reaction is progressing, two chlorine radicals can react with each other. and turn back into chlorine gas. So this is a termination step. This is completely possible. Something else that could happen is that a chlorine radical can terminate with a methyl radical. given us the product methyl chloride. So that's another termination step. Or we can get two methyl radicals terminating each other. And this will give us ethane. So ethane is a byproduct of the chlorination of methane. So these are some termination steps that can occur during the chlorination of methane. Now consider the reaction between propane and chlorine gas. What will be the products of this reaction? And let's compare it with propane and bromine. Identify the major products in each of these uh, reactions. Now what you need to know is that chlorine is 
highly reactive. Chlorine is more reactive than bromine. And when it reacts with an alkane, it's going to be non-selective. Bromine is less reactive than chlorine. And as a result, it's going to be selective. Now, chlorine can replace the secondary hydrogen, that is the hydrogen on the secondary carbon, or it can replace the primary hydrogen. It's non-selective. It could replace either one of them. So in this free radical substitution reaction, we can replace the secondary hydrogen with chlorine, giving us this product, or we can replace the primary hydrogen with chlorine. So we get a mixture of products. We can get one chloropropane or two chloro. We actually get both, one chloropropane and two chloropropane. Now bromine on the other hand is highly selective. It's going to preferentially replace the secondary hydrogen as opposed to the primary hydrogen. So the major product will be 2-bromopropane. Now, as the reactivity of the halogen increases, the selectivity decreases. So if we were to focus on the periodic table, we have the halogens fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Fluorine is highly reactive. Therefore, it's going to be the least selective. Iodine is not reactive enough to replace a hydrogen from an alkane. So the two that we tend to use are these two. Fluorine is too reactive to use. It's, it reacts violently with alkane, so it's basically too dangerous to use. Chlorine, on the other hand, is less reactive than fluorine. It's not as dangerous as fluorine, but it's reactive enough where it'll obstruct any of these hydrogens that it encounters. Bromine reacts much more slowly than chlorine. It's less reactive. But it can react with either one of these two hydrogens. But because it reacts slowly, it's going to prefer to replace the secondary hydrogen over the primary hydrogen. And the reason for this has to do with radical stability. A tertiary radical is more stable than a secondary radical. And that's more stable than a primary radical, which is more stable than a methyl radical. This is similar to the stability of carbocations. Radicals in carbocations, they're both electron deficient. So they want electrons. Therefore, the trend for stability is the same. A secondary carbocation is more stable I mean, a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary one, and that's more stable than a primary carbocation, and so forth. Now, carbanions are opposite to this trend. Carbanions don't want any more electrons. They already have plenty of electrons. So a methyl carbanion is more stable than a primary carbanion which is more stable than the secondary carbonyl. And tertiary carbonyls are the least stable. So carbonyls are nucleophilic. They're electron rich. And so tertiary carbonyls are the least stable. Electrophiles and carbocations, I mean radicals and carbocations are electrophiles. They are electron poor and they want electrons. So tertiary radicals and tertiary carbocations are the most stable. The methyl groups that are attached to the carbocation, they can donate electron density by means of the inductive effect and by means of hyperconjugation to stabilize the carbocation and even stabilize the radical as well.
Now you might be wondering why the reaction between an alkane and chlorine is less selective than the reaction between an alkane and bromine. It has to do with the relative differences in the activation energies of each reaction. Now let's consider the reaction diagram between the alkane and chlorine. Would you say this is an endothermic reaction or an exothermic reaction? Notice that the energy of the reactants is greater than the energy of the products. So therefore, this is going to be an exothermic reaction. Now, according to the Hammond postulate, does the transition state resemble more like the reactants or more like the products? So notice that in an exothermic reaction, the transition state is closer in energy to the reactants. So therefore, it's going to resemble more like the reactants. Notice that the relative, like the energy differences between the products is large, but the energy differences between the reactants are small. And because the transition state resemble more like the reactants on the left side, or for the reaction between these two, the differences in activation energy will be small because the differences in the energy of the reactants is also small. Now let's consider the situation on the right. Do we have an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction? Notice that the energy of the products is greater than the energy of the reactants. So we have an endothermic reaction for the reaction between an alkane and bromine. So according to the Hammond postulate, the transition state resembles more like the products because they're closer in energy. Now, because the products have a huge difference in energy, the energy of the transition states will be significantly different. So therefore, the change in activation energy between each reaction is going to be larger. And here is the key. The reason why chlorine is less selective is because the differences in the activation energy for abstracting a primary hydrogen or a secondary hydrogen, the difference in the activation energy is small. So that's why chlorine is less selective. In the case of bromine, the difference in activation energy is large. And so bromine will selectively abstract a tertiary hydrogen much more than it would a secondary hydrogen. It's due to the large differences in activation energy. Now let's discuss the relative reactivity rates of chlorine and bromine when they're abstracting a hydrogen from an alkane. So we know that Chlorine is more likely to abstract a tertiary hydrogen compared to a secondary or primary hydrogen. We're going to assign a primary hydrogen a value of 1. At room temperature, a chlorine radical is 3.8 times more likely to abstract a secondary hydrogen than a primary hydrogen, or more specifically, it's 3.8 times easier for a chlorine radical to abstract a secondary hydrogen from a primary hydrogen. And for a tertiary hydrogen, it's five times easier for the chlorine radical to replace a tertiary hydrogen as opposed to replacing a primary hydrogen. So these are the relative rates of formation for the different types of hydrogens on an alkane when chlorine is reacting with that alkane. Now let's talk about bromine. So for the primary hydrogen, let's assign it a value of one. Now for bromine, it is 82 times easier for it to abstract a secondary hydrogen than a primary hydrogen. And it's 1600 times easier for the bromine radical 
to replace a tertiary hydrogen relative to a primary hydrogen. So we could see why, based on these numbers, bromine is much more selective than chlorine. So both radicals prefer to abstract a tertiary radical, I mean a tertiary hydrogen. And the reason for that is tertiary radicals are more stable than primary radicals. But looking at the difference, in the case of chlorine, it's five times easier for it to abstract a, a tertiary hydrogen than a primary hydrogen. But for bromine, it's 1,600 times more easier. So thus, we can see why, based on these numbers, chlorine is, even though it's more reactive, it's less selective in abstracting a proton than bromine is. Now let's work on some math problems. So let's go back to propane. And we're going to react it with chlorine in the presence of ultraviolet light. Now, as was mentioned before, chlorine is not very selective. So we're going to get a mixture of products. We're going to get two chloropropane and one chloropropane. But now, Using the relative rates of formation that we mentioned earlier, how can we calculate the percent yield of each of these two products? Feel free to pause the video if you want to try it. So remember, the relative rates for each hydrogen is 5 to 3.8 to 1. So the first thing we need to do is identify the different types of hydrogen atoms. There's only two hydrogen atoms that will give us this particular product. Let's call it hydrogen A. Now here we have two methyl groups. If we replace any one of those hydrogens, we can get one chloropropane. So there's six potential hydrogen atoms that can give us one chloropropane. So now let's focus on the secondary hydrogen atoms, that is hydrogen A. So this is secondary because it's on a secondary carbon and this is primary. The reason why this carbon is secondary is because it's attached to two other carbons. And the reason why this carbon is primary is because it's attached to only one other carbon. Now for the secondary hydrogens, we only have two of them. And the reactivity rate for secondary hydrogen when dealing with chlorine at room temperature is 3.8. So if we multiply 2 and 3.8, we get 7.6. Now for the primary hydrogens, we know that there's six of them. And we're going to multiply by the relative reactivity rate for a primary hydrogen, which is 1. And so we get 6. And then we're going to add these two numbers. 7.6 plus 6 is 13.6. Now, to get the percent yield, we're going to take 7.6 and divide it by this total number, which is 13.6. And then we're going to multiply that by 100%. So if you take 7.6 and divided by 13.6 times 100, that will give you the percent yield for 2 chloropropane, which is 55.9% if you round it. So this came from the secondary hydrogen. This chlorine, uh, the secondary hydrogen was replaced with chlorine. Now for the other one, simply take this number, 6, divided by 13.6 and then times 100% and you get 44.1%. So that's the relative percent yield for one chloropropane. So for this particular example, two chloropropane is the major product, one chloropropane is the minor product. 